All right. So uh, let's begin. Uh, we've been looking at uh, quite a few quotes right now. The last thing we looked at was Reed Miller quotes. Uh, so let me just summarize as to where we are uh, right now. Okay. So at this point, I think uh, what we should be com comfortable doing. Open. We are at the very end. You're okay. You don't want the fan. I don't know if you can hear me, but it's okay. Don't matter. Okay. So, so what we've been looking at is uh, uh, so so what are the various things we saw? So we saw uh, basically read Solomon. DC of course. Okay. Then we saw read Miller quotes. So essentially, this this was our this was uh, where we got to, and and uh, these two guys were uh, were interesting from various points of view, and they similar quotes, uh, other interesting properties. But essentially, what we can do now is, given a block one, given a block one, and given p, which is the required error correcting capability. We can come up with a code, most probably a Reed Solomon or a PCH code, which can which can achieve this. Okay, so these two can achieve for a given block length and error correcting capability. They can achieve some. Uh, you can do some code construction, and, and in fact, this is uh, also good from a complexity point of view. Okay, the construction is easy to do. Then even the decoding is easy to do. Okay, so you have an algorithm which works. Okay. So nice thing about Reed Miller codes is they are probably not as efficient as the Reed Solomon and BCH codes, but they have some other properties. The decoder is even simpler than the Reed Solomon and BCH codes, and they work uh, very directly with the parity checks and all that. And it's very intuitive and nice to decode. Okay, and like I said, the decoder that we use for the Reed Miller code is can be extended for other things also, and we'll see that in the next course. Okay. So this is where we are as far as the course is concerned, and. Uh, we have about three weeks to go, right? Two and a half to three weeks, I think. Okay, so and we're going to take um, uh, take some. I mean, what we're going to do in the next uh, two three weeks is uh, first thing we'll look at are a couple of issues like uh, concatenated constructions. That's what we'll see today. Mostly it'll be over today. I mean, it may not even take all of today. Okay. So after that, we'll move on to an area for weight distribution. Okay, and uh, time permitting, we might do something else after that. So after that, maybe a uh, little bit of more more interesting stuff. So these two, I want to do, and with that, I think more or less the the course itself will be over. And uh, after that, we'll worry about a few things. And I think we're doing okay on time. Uh, in case we are, we are a little short, we might uh, do something else. Okay. So this idea of concatenation is very powerful. It's very crucial, and even in modern codes, they are used a lot. Okay. So this notion of thinking of of one code in terms of several other codes, and uh, and what what I'm going to do is uh, talk about concatenations next. Okay. So so what is so, so so the first kind of concatenation we'll talk about is what's known as a product code. This is not really a concatenation. This is a, I mean, so, so I'm putting it under the general topic of concatenations because it's it's it's, it's uh, it falls under the category of put, uh, bringing two different codes together and constructing a new code. Okay, so that's the idea of concatenations. Okay, so you bring two different codes together. Okay, so how do you do that? Is the the idea and the concatenation. The first thing you'll see is the product code. Okay, product code is quite simple. It's an interesting, interesting little idea. So, so what what you do is you have two codes, so C1, which is an N1 K1 D1 code. You have another code C2, which is an N2 K2 D2 code. Okay. 
okay so you have two codes uh, n1 k1 d1 and n2 k2 c okay so let's say g1 was the tendered matrix of c1 and g2 is the tendered matrix of c okay in the product construction what you do is you take uh, so what you do is the product construction the product of c1 and c2 uh, will result in So the product construction will result in n1 times n2 comma k1 times k2 code. Okay, so we we'll come back to the minimum distance later on, but essentially the code will be n1, n2, and k1, k2. So that's why we call it the product. Okay, so the dimension gets multiplied, the block length gets multiplied. Okay, so this is the this is the code that you're going to get. Okay, so the code essentially has k1, k2 message bits, right? So we'll think of the message as a matrix. Okay. Okay. So so far we've been thinking of the message as a vector. You can also think of it as a matrix. In the product construction, it's convenient to think of it as a matrix. You can of course also unwrap it and think of it as one big long vector if you want. But the matrix is is helpful. Okay. So I'm going to have a message M, which is a remember K1 by K2 matrix. Okay. So to get a code word of the product code. Okay, so the code word. You can imagine if this message is a K1 by K2 matrix. What's my code word going to be? Okay, keeping with the same spirit, what will my code word be? How many bits are there in the code word? N1, N2. So, what is my code word going to be? N1 cross N2 matrix. Okay, so I want N1 cross N2 matrix. I am going to take this message matrix and do something with it and get a code word which is an n1 cross n2 matrix. Okay, so what I do is the following. So I'll take g1 transpose and multiply on the left side, and then I'll take g2 and multiply on the right side. Is that okay? So that's what I'm going to do to get a n1 cross n2 matrix, and this is essentially the product construction. So okay, okay. So first of all, this multiplication is very well defined. Okay, see G1 transpose. What's the size of? What's the dimension of G1 transpose? N1 cross K1. Okay, so that I can definitely multiply with an M, which is K1 cross K2. And G2 is also K2 cross N2, and I do definitely get a N1 cross N2 matrix. Okay, so first of all, is this product code a linear code? How do you check if this is linear? You take a message M1, produce a code word with it. Take a message M2, produce a code word with it, and then add the two. What happens? You naturally get the M code word corresponding to M1 plus M2, so it's linear. Okay, so that's what this is linear. Okay. Uh, what is the next interesting question that we can ask about this code? Okay, so the minimum distance, right? The minimum distance, the rate. Maybe okay, what will be the rate? K1, K2 by N1, N2. Product of the two rates. It's not so interesting. Minimum distance is an interesting thing. Okay. To get to the minimum distance, uh, there is one little property that we can do, which is nice. Okay, so in this code word matrix, okay, so let's look at the code word matrix a little bit more closely. Okay, it's going to be n1 cross n2. It will have n1 rows and n2 columns. Okay, an arbitrary row of this matrix. What can I say about it? Oh my goodness! <laughs> a row of this matrix of this code word. Okay, code word matrix. Right, a row of this matrix. Does it have any interesting property? Can you observe something from the way it was constructed? What will be the row? Sorry. Why? Yeah. So it is. It will be some code word of C two. Okay. So that's the first statement I want. And then we'll worry about the minimum distance later. Okay. 
So this will be a code word of why is that true? Okay, you can do the multiplication G and transpose M first. Remember, matrix multiplication is associated. You can do it in any order. You get the same answer. So you do the multiplication G one transpose M first, and you get some matrix, and then you multiply by G two. Okay, so finally, what you get the row will will actually be a combination of the rows of G two. So clearly, that has to belong to the code C. What about any column? Yeah, but any column will be a code word of C one. Is it okay? We're fine. How do you get to that? You do the multiplication m times g2 first, and then you multiply by g1 transpose on the left. The product you get column will be a linear combination of the columns of g1 transpose, which is nothing but the rows of g1, and that has to be a power word of C. Okay, so it's just basic matrix multiplication, but you get that answer. Okay, so this is a crucial property. So every row of the product code word is is a code word of C2. Every column of a product code word is a code word of C1. Okay, so that's uh, that's an advantage. That's a that's a nice property to have for the product of the two two codes. Is it okay? So now we can think about the minimum distance. Let's let's worry about minimum distance. Okay, so does this tell you anything about the minimum distance? N1 D2. Oh, be careful! Be careful! Be careful! Think about that. N and all cannot enter the picture. You are violating all kinds of stuff. Just just think about you. Just I can have all zero. Try to go too fast, I think. Okay, so let's do it step by step. Okay, suppose somebody tells me there is a non-zero code word matrix. Okay. Right? If somebody tells me there is a non-zero code word matrix, there should be at least one column which is non-zero. Right? If all columns are zero, then you are uh, finished. Okay? There should be at least one column which is non-zero. You go to that column. How many ones should be there in the column? At least D one. Okay? Right? There should be at least D one ones in that non-zero column. So now go to those D one rows corresponding to the Non-zero values in that column. Each of those D1 rows is non-zero, and is a code word of C2. So each of those D1 rows should have weight at least D2. So what should the overall weight be? At least D1 times D2. Okay. So that's the final result. So there is yet another way to view this multiplication, which will complicate things a little bit. So typically, we take G1 and G2 to be systematic form, right? We take it in systematic form. Okay. So that when you do G1 transpose M G2, okay, what will happen if you take G1 and G2 in systematic form? The code word will be. Yeah. So M will be a part of it on the top K1. K1 by K2 part, right? There will be a top K1 by K2 part, and then there will be a n minus K1 part, n1 minus K1 part, and n2 minus K2 part. Here, okay. So what's happening in the encoding? You first encoding M by G2 such say. Okay. Then you fill out all these parities. Okay. And then what are you doing? Encoding each column by G1, so we'll be filling out all these parities. Okay, right? So usually people think of these parities as the row parities of M, and these parities as the column parities of M, and then what are these parities? They are parities on the parities. Okay, so you get that, right? So if I describe it to you this way. It's a bit more complicated to quickly. I mean, so you, it may not. You might. So, so remember the other fact: every column is still a code word of C1, and every row is still a code word of C2. Okay, so it's a little bit more complicated to think of it that way. But remember, that is true always. Okay, so you encode by C2 first, and then encode by C1, 
it's not clear why every row should again be a code word of C2. Okay, but that's how much matrix multiplication works. Okay, so you can do it either way. So it has to be consistent in some way. So it has to be clear. Okay, so every row, so even these rows will be code words of C2. Okay, so it may not be immediately clear, but that's the truth. Okay. So this is how the structure of a code word uh, will look, and minimum distance is greater than or equal to D1D. Okay. So let's take some nice examples here. So one way of uh, doing this example is to take some simple codes. Let's say, for instance, you have the 743 code, right? Okay. Except in some very strange cases, usually you take C1 to be equal to C2. Okay, so that's a very common uh, situation. So nobody takes anything out of that. So you, you look at the product of C and C. What will be its parameters? 49, 16, greater than or equal to 9. Okay. So you have a four error correcting code of length. 49. We're okay. So suppose you were to come up with a DCH code with length 49, right? What will happen? So directly, if I construct it, right? So maybe 49 may may not be used to it. Maybe length 63. Okay. So let's say length 63, DCH code of four other correcting. What will you have? What will be the? What will be K? Comma, what will be k? I'm sorry, 39, right? So we have to subtract 24. Okay, so 39 comma greater than or equal to 9. Okay, so in case this case is going to be equal to 9, I know that, but can you solve this matter? Okay, so so you need 24 parities. So if you try and shorten, what will happen? You can always shorten, right? When you shorten, you can go to a 49, and then you have to subtract 24. So we'll have 25 greater than or equal to 9. Okay. So, if you construct it directly okay, using the DCH, you have an advantage over the product code. Okay. Definitely, the product code is not that interesting from optimal dimension for a given minimum distance point of view, at least in this example. In many examples also, it could be true. One need to be careful there. Okay. So, this is this is the situation. Okay. But then, there are some other advantages that the product code buys you. I will come to that soon enough. But anyway, but remember that this, this can be a problem. Okay. So, maybe Maybe one more thing you can try is uh, some some simple stuff, you know. So so to improve your rate, maybe you want to take uh, so this is the first example. Maybe you want to take C to be the seven four three hundred code, and then maybe you you take C two to be let's say nine eight two even even weight code. So let's try that just for fun. There's a few few cases just to see how it works out. What's the product of C1 and C2? Okay, so it's 63, 32, greater than or equal to 6. Right? So if I try to construct it directly by uh, BCH, what will I get? If I want minimum distance, let's say 5. Okay, so 5 is more reasonable. So if that's t equals 2, you will get even a 63, 51 code. Okay, so it's not that competitive. Maybe you want to try something else. Let's try something else. Okay, let's take C1 to be 8 comma 4 comma 4 code. How will I get the 8 comma 4 comma 4 code? You can take the Hamming code and do an extension by 1. Or it's the same as the Reed Muller code. Okay, so the first order uh, Reed Muller code of length uh, 8. Okay, so that will be this. And let's say we we'll just do C1. Let's just do C with C. And what do you get? 64, 16, 16. Now that's a little bit more interesting. 16 is a large minimum distance. Okay. If you want to do a corresponding DCH code, 
you can aim for a 63 code with length 15 and then maybe extend it and get this ok suppose you try that then what will you get DCA should be 63 suppose I want greater than equal to 15 what will be DCA remember this D, D min greater than equal to 15 corresponds to T greater than T equal to 7 right and we know a lower bound on the K for BCA what is the lower bound N minus MT M is going to be 6 6 into 7 is 42 63 minus 42 is 11 right for 21 I am sorry, sorry. <laughs> cannot be that bad ok so it is 21 ok so you see in, in most cases it looks like the BCH code is going to be from a rate point of view better overall if you directly consider ok but the product code will have some advantage ok so let me say what the advantage is the advantage will be in the decoding ok so there is a there is a structure to the product code which the BCH code does not have you can exploit that that is basically that each column is a code word of a smaller code ok you do not have to worry too hard about decoding that ok each row is a code word of a smaller code ok so you can take that row alone and do some suboptimal decoding and try to combine all of them together and play some tricks there ok so those things you cannot do with the BCH code you will have to directly run your Bellicam Massey for decoding 7 errors and that is going to take some time ok so that is where you can put the game that is one thing and the other thing is uh, finding soft input decoders for product codes is also easier little bit easier than finding it for direct PC so those are advantages today people look at it but let me try and motivate this decoder thing ok so we will look at the 743 Hamming code ok so we will go back to this uh, original example so we had your product of 743 with itself ok let us try and come up with a decoder which will correct 4 errors ok so let us see if it is possible or not ok let us try that ok so decoding product codes ok so let us say so we will do this by example I am not going to do it in great detail this is just example Ok, so you take the 743 coming with itself Ok, the product is basically a 4916 greater than or equal to 9 code Ok, so you should be able to correct 4 errors right, so from just a single error character So let us look at the structure of the code so basically a 7 cross 7 Word, right? Okay. Each row is a code word of the Hamming code. Each column is a code word of the Hamming code. Okay. Right? And you can have, suppose I can have any four errors. Okay. So this is a code word. Let's say this is a received word. I'm sorry. It's a received word. So any four positions can be an error. Okay. So so how can I? So is there any strategy that you can think of which is useful in correcting? Any ideas? How can I go about correcting errors? Let's say that let's say there are some P errors. Okay. Okay, and then we are in the received word. What is the strategy that you can use? How do you use the product property? Find correct property. Okay. So you try to do it one row at a time or one column at a time, right? So that's the idea. Okay. So try and decode. one row at a time or one column at a time ok so now we will have some interesting combinatorial situations arising ok so typically I mean if I want to correct all the way up to the minimum distance capability I want to be able to correct 4 error patterns ok so if my 4 error patterns are like this then what will happen ok so if I try and correct row wise, I'll be in trouble. Okay, but then what can I do? If I correct column wise, I'll be okay. Yeah, I'll be able to correct. So okay, all right. So likewise, you can think of so many other ways in which these four errors can distribute over a seven cross seven matrix. 
Okay, is there any case in which I will never be able to correct either row wise or column wise? If they are in the same column, then my row decoder will correct everything. There is some error, uh, which is part of a column which has four errors and is part of a row which also has the same. There are only four, let us say that I am looking at only four, maximum of four. If it is, yeah, so they need to be in a shape like this. Okay, so any other shape is correctable. But if we form this shape, what will happen? What will happen if we form this shape? Yeah, so there will be a trouble. Whether you go row wise or column wise, you will never be able to correct it fully. So you have to combine both the row and the column. Okay, so what do you do? You go row wise and see which rows there are errors. Okay, so all the syndromes will evaluate to 0 except for two, error, two rows. Okay, likewise in the columns. All the syndromes will evaluate to 0 except for 2 columns okay, and then you have to do some additional work, you have to think about what is the possibility, right? So if it is it, is it just 1 or is it 2, see there are so many cases, right? So you have to work it out combinatorially one after the other. So basically it is I think possible you can, for this for this case you can list out a case by case thing and correct it for 4 others. I think it might be possible, so I am not very sure. Okay. <laughs> So you should not decode, that is what I am saying. Just compute the syndrome, all the row syndromes, compute all the column syndromes, okay, right. If you have only one row syndrome being non-zero, I mean so many combinations are possible, right. So you have to, you have to try and correct and then re-evaluate all the syndromes. So, so there are so many things you can do. So, so one thing you can do is, you look at all the rows, okay, okay, you compute all the syndromes and correct errors just based on that and then go through all the columns, okay, go through all the columns and then correct errors based on that and then go through all the rows, keep iterating it till all the row syndromes are 0 and the column syndromes are 0, okay, keep on doing this iteratively, okay, alright, usually it should work except that these kind of cases may not work very well, okay, so, so what will happen if I do row wise what will happen, there are two errors, if you do the Hamming correction what will happen? It will try and introduce another error somewhere and these two will introduce another error here, okay. We do not know how it will work out. So, I mean I think it should actually introduce in the same place, right. So, it is a Hamming code, it is the same code. So, you will get another error here. And then when you go column wise, then more errors will be introduced and we keep on exploding, okay. So, you cannot just do it row iteration, column iteration in a dumb fashion. You have to use the row iteration and column iteration together in the next iteration, etc, etc, okay. So, off the top of my head, I do not know if there is an algorithm or not, but I believe you can come up with something which might be able to correct all four errors, okay. So, it may be an exhaustive, more painful list than the that will be doing it, but you might be able to correct it, okay. So, essentially, the idea is to iterate between row and column decoders. Okay, and this is quite powerful, you know. So what will happen is when you do these kind of iterations, you usually cannot guarantee an error correcting capability. Okay, you cannot say all errors of weight t I might be able to correct. Okay, you just do a simple iteration, right? You won't be able to correct this pattern, for instance. If you just do all the rows, all the columns, and keep on doing it, you will never be able to correct this pattern. But this pattern is kind of peculiar. You know, it requires some very precise coordination between the way the row and column errors happen. But so many other patterns which have even more errors can be corrected. So many 5 error patterns, so many 6 error patterns can be corrected, right. It is not that it is a very sharp bounded distance decoder. It will be a strange non bounded distance decoder. You can think of the combinator X here. So many other errors you will be able to correct. And that is an advantage in practice several times. Even though you cannot precisely guarantee error correcting capability, if you can only not correct very few error patterns, that is okay. okay. Usually that these things do not occur with a very high probability probability will be low, it might be better. Okay, so these kind of ideas are powerful today in the modern probabilistic kind of decoding as opposed to the very bounded distance type of decoding. These kind of ideas are very popular. You just iterate. The nice thing is each iteration is not very painful. Okay, you are just correcting on having code. I mean how hard is it? It is not like you do not need any finite field or anything. Just quickly you can correct one having code after the other. So component decoders are very simple and you kind of do some iterations here and there using some part of the code. Another crucial point I want you to observe is 
you can also write this code word out as a 49 length vector ok so let's try and do that if you write the code word as a 49 length vector ok so maybe c11, c12, I'll go to c17 c21, c22, I'll go to c27 all the way to c71, c72, c77 ok so basically you write code word as a vector Okay, so one nice property I have is that these guys belong to the belong to what? 743 Hamming code, right? So in the example, I'm mean, still sticking with this example, okay? Okay, so each of these guys belong to the Hamming code. Likewise, these guys also belong to the Hamming code, right? So, 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 so basically, this code word has some local structure. What do I mean by local? I mean, a few of the code word bits together have some structure to them. Yeah, overall, the code itself has some structure, and that might be a very long, long code word. You may not be interested in exploiting that overall code structure. Okay? But locally, there might be some nice structure which you can quickly exploit, and there is some merit in it, particularly if you can iterate between these local structures and then try to combine them in some global way, if you can, or even just iterate blindly. Eventually, okay? the global structure will begin to assert itself. Right? So iterating, but you have to combine them carefully, and then you'll you'll bring in the the thing together. Okay, so this kind of idea is a very powerful today. Okay, so in today's modern interpretation, you use some local structure in the code word, and then try and iterate and get to your advantage. Okay, so 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 this product code is a very very simple way in which you can bring in local structure. Okay, so it's not so efficient, but it's nice. Okay, so but also other local structures. For instance, these guys together. Okay, they also have some structure. So you kind of interlace these local structures and then you get some more interesting ideas coming out. Okay. Alright, so you can you can definitely generalize these decoders. Okay. You can generalize this decoder and construct some more general decoders for the N1, K1, D1 case. But usually you you may not be able to guarantee that you can correct up to Direct correcting capability. You may not be able to guarantee that, but what will be true? You will be able to correct a significant fraction of the errors, maybe one or two here and there. You may not be able to correct depending on the pattern. But if you don't care about it, you will be okay. okay. You can implement a decoder. Yes? Number of the form belongs to the code. Yeah. Some of the two of them belongs to the code. So yeah, yeah. This still is a code in vectorial form. Yeah, yeah. So I should be able to find a generated metric form. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. You can try to generate a parity matrix for this also. Yeah, so can I do anything with the decoding? Overall, combine it with a big matrix. You see, the problem is, yeah, it won't scale. That's the problem. The small numbers, you can do it. But when you go to like, uh, when you want to take a product of two big codes, oh, yeah, you may not do it. Really. I didn't say it can always be corrected. I said there might be some patterns for which you may not be able so to correct. In those cases, if I write it out like this, my K is the same, which means that T, no, my D is the same, which means my T has to be corrected by my code. For the what decoder? Normal distance decoder for what? For the 49 length. What is that decoder? It will be the syndrome decoder, the ML decoder. Okay, so then ML decoder is very complex, that's my point. Right? You don't want to go to the ML decoder for the long long code. Because the ML decoder for the small code is not bad. But long code you don't want to do an ML decoder. That's the idea. Okay. So there are several several key ideas here. Basically, I'm going to use the decoders for the component codes to decode a larger concatenated code. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay. Why, why what is the advantage that the component codes are easier to decode? Okay, they are smaller block length is smaller, maybe I have better decoders for them, I can implement the decoders and I can cleverly combine them to decode the original code, overall code. Okay, there might be some problems with error correcting capability and all that, but that's fine, I'll live with it. But my decoder is very, very simple. Okay. Not only that, it can correct beyond error correcting capability. Okay. So, the other boundary distance decoders have the problem that beyond error correcting capability, there is a failure. No? These decoders won't have that failure, they will do something, okay, eventually they might also decode. 
some cases they may profit. Okay, so there are both advantages and disadvantages. Okay, did you have a question? Okay. So that those are those are important ideas. Okay, so you retain them in your mind. These kind of ideas are quite important. Okay. So there's another kind of concatenation which I'm going to talk about now. Okay, so this was uh, these are these are actually called concatenated probes. Okay, now we'll explain the product codes. I'm not going to talk more about product codes. Uh, oh, how will I write the generator matrix? You can do it. I mean, it's not uh, so. You can think of it this way, right? If you have the messages, see there are seven code words in the row, right? And then you have to so you have to first convert it into the other message. It's a little bit more complicated. It's not that easy. It can be done. You can write it. Okay, maybe that will be a problem in the final exam. Okay. <laughs> How do you write the generator matrix for the overall? Code? Okay, parity check matrices also can be written. Yeah, here also it's from silly space. No, I mean it's it's actually a length 49. When I say length 49, 16 code, you write it as a 7 by 7 matrix, but it's a length 49 linear code. There's nothing wrong with that. In that case, what we have to do is we have to split it into individual message vectors to get these separate things. So, parity check matrix I think is a little bit easier. Okay, so, parity check matrix, you have some of these things. Each of these things individually will satisfy the H. So, you can put H in a block diagonal form. Okay, the same H. Is that enough? That's not enough. Then you also have the, the other column satisfying. So, another set of H will come in a slightly permuted form. Okay. So that's a valid parity check matrix. That 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 fully gives you that. But you, you know, from there we will have to do elimination, go to a generator matrix. Generator matrix, I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit more complicated. But parity check matrix, at least in principle, is easy. You can use them. Yeah, I think it's possible. But to think about it. So essentially, the overall code can be written as m1 times something plus m2 times something. So each message multiplying some vector. You can do it. It's not really Okay. So, all right. Maybe there is some chronic or product or something involved in the answer, final answer. Might be might come out like that. Think about it. Okay, so that's product codes and uh, there are some so many ideas there which are very useful. Okay, so once again remember the idea use two small codes to construct a bigger code. The big advantage is in the decoding side. You can decode with the two small codes, exploit the local structure. You may not be able to give any guarantees on error correcting capability, but a large fraction of errors, even beyond error correcting capability, might be corrected. Okay, those are the ideas. The next kind of concatenated code is a little bit more uh, more theoretical, but I'll, I'll write it down here just for completeness. Okay. So in these ideas, what you do is, so in this in this case, concatenated code is basically due to Fermi. So we also call Fermi's concatenated codes. So you start with an n comma k code over g of 2 power i. Okay. So I am putting all capitals because small letters are also going to come. Okay. So g of 2 power m or let me, let me be careful here. n comma k code over g of 2 power let me put small k. Okay. This is the first code c. c1. Okay. Then I will take an n comma k code over the set of two. Is that okay? Is this yeah, yeah. The two k's are the same. They have to be the same. So let me think about that once again. Let me make sure that's fine. Yeah, I think it's fine. Okay. So okay. Is it okay? These two k's are the same. Okay, same k here. Okay, I'm going to concatenate them using that. So what I'll do first is I'll take k times k bits. This will be my overall message. Okay. When I take k times k bits, these are also k elements of what? Gf two power k. So I can encode it with c1. I will get n elements of Gf two power k. Or what? K times n books 
Okay. Now I will view this k times n bits as n blocks of small k bits, capital N blocks of small k bits, and then encode with C2 k at the time. Okay. What will I get outside? N times n bits. Is that okay? This is my idea. Okay. So I have an n comma k code over some field, but I will not use that code like that. I'll use its expanded version. Okay. So that's the idea. So when I use the expanded version, everything is in terms of bits. So this overall code is called the concatenated code. Okay. So let me put some minimum distance here. Sorry for that. I'm going to add the minimum distance here. Perfectly. Small. Okay. So my first question is: Is this code linear? Okay. So we're doing some GS2 parquet conversion and all that. Is that okay? All that's okay because anyway, addition in GS2 parquet is the same as binary XOR, which is again addition in. Uh, in GF2, so it doesn't matter. So this code is linear, there's no problem. What will be its dimension? It's going to be small k times capital K. What is going to be the block length? Small n times capital N. What about the minimum distance? What can I say about minimum distance? Greater than equal to which D? Capital D. Uh, okay, so think about it. Think about it a little bit more carefully. Okay, so you have n elements of GF2 par k. If I have a non zero code word, how many of those elements will be non zero? At least DK. What is K entering the picture? Okay, so I have a capital N, comma capital K, comma capital D code over GF2 par K. Okay, every code where non-zero code word has at least how many non-zero elements? Capital D. That's the definition of minimum distance. Every non-zero code word of this code has at least capital D non-zero elements in it. Okay, so which means in my second encoding, how many non-zero code words must be there? See, in the second encoding, what am I doing? I am taking capital N elements and each element is being encoded into a code word, the, the, the bit in the vector representation. Okay? How many of these elements were non-zero? Capital D. So, how many non-zero code words of C2 will I get after encoding? Capital D non-zero code words of C2 I will get after encoding. So, each code word of C2, non-zero code word of C2 has, has what weight? small d. So, what should be the minimum weight of the overall vector? Capital D times small d. Is it okay? Is it okay? So, there is some argument here which you have to carefully think about. Is it okay? You are not convinced? Okay. So, think about it this way. Okay. So I do, so I have here k times k bits, okay, each row is an element of what, gf2 tag k. So I do the encoding here, what will I have, n times k bits, each row is an element of gf2 tag k. How many of these have to be non-zero? Some d of them have to be non-zero, let us say these are the d, okay. Okay. What do I do in the next step? I take each row and encode it with C2. That's what I'm doing in the next step. Is that clear? Maybe what I what I'm doing in the next step was not clear to you. Okay. I take each row and then get the n bit code word of each row is a code word of what? C2. Is that okay? So I have d non-zero messages to encode, which means d of these rows will be non-zero, and each row has to have weight greater than or equal to small d. So overall, the weight will be greater than or equal to small d times capital D. If you view it in this matrix form, it's a little bit clearer. But usually, you don't think of matrix when you 
uh, in this language. Just think of it as a row. Okay. Is that okay? So once again, we have a very similar idea here where we brought in two small codes and obtained a product-like construction. But this is not very simple product-like construction. Okay. There is some complication here because you're going to this higher field and you're doing some encoding there and then coming back to this the, the binary field and doing some encoding there. So it's not very simple like product construction. But nevertheless, the principles that we had there are equally true. Okay, so there is a there are two small two codes which are component codes of a bigger code. Then each code has some local structure which you can try to exploit and do some decoding and try to conveniently or try to combine it with something else. Okay, so let's take an example and see how this looks. Uh, let's take uh, I don't know. I mean, just uh, let's take uh, two fifty five comma two. Uh, what do you like? What do you like? What do you like? So let's say two forty five comma eleven R S code over G S two fifty six. Okay, so. So just, just like that. I mean, just you can take anything else also if you like. I'm just taking this. One. Okay, is that okay? And then you concatenate with concatenate with. Okay. The number of k's eight, right? So I need a some code word with k eight. But let, let's take the nine comma eight even weight code. Okay. So nine eight two. You know what it is. Nine comma eight even weight code. So when you do that, what will you get? So two fifty five times nine. What is that? Two hmm? two nine five. And what is this? Two forty five times eight. Sorry. Thousand eight hundred. One eight four zero. One eight six zero. Okay. Divided by eight is two. Are you sure? So one eight eight zero. One nine six zero. Okay. And then minimum distance is greater than or equal to. Twenty-two. Okay. Is that okay? So, so if you just run uh, read solve and decode, you, you can expect to only correct how many errors? Five errors, right? You can't correct more than five errors. Minimum distance is eleven. This distance, this is saying minimum distance is twenty-two. So you should be able to correct like ten errors. Okay. How do you put it together? I mean, how do you? How, is there any idea? I mean, what can you do? How will you correct? Ten errors. Okay, so the structure is a little bit confusing, right? So the code word has this picture. How can I hope to correct ten errors suddenly? Does it make sense? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true. But I want a simple decoder. I mean, I want to be able to combine these two decoders. Okay. I don't want. I don't want to say. Okay, this is a overall binary code. You do central decoding on it. Right? Of course, I you know, have you know, no problems with that. But is there any anything that you can think of? Any smart ideas? Yeah. So reverse order we decode. What do you do? With the nine eight two code, what can you do? You can't decode anything. No? So that's a problem. What can you do? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have to use tricks like that. So, so what you do is for each each thing here, you find the parity. If the parity is zero, you let it alone. If the parity is one. What do you do? Definitely, there's an error. So, what can you? How can you help the read Solomon code when you know that there is definitely an error? You just say that's an erasure. So, you tell the next guy that this part is erased. Okay. So now, okay. So I have to be slightly careful here. Okay, 
let's say there are 10 errors distributed over 10 different blocks one error each in different blocks then this scheme will correct it why because I have marked 10 erasures and the read Solomon code can correct 10 erasures ok can I claim that this this decoder the strategy that I am using will correct all error vectors of weight less than or equal to 10 yes it needs more work okay. don't say just say why do I have less number of erasures? Which means so the erasures can definitely be corrected. Once those erasures are corrected, I will I check I look at the code word, I look at the key length uh, code word and that code word will not match the it won't be a read solvent code word. So now I'll have to correct the code word. Anyway, so be be a little bit careful. You you can easily have an erasures plus error situation. Okay, so you have to do erasures plus error decoding. Okay. And you have to be careful about that because if there are two errors in one block what will happen my parity will be satisfied and I won't mark it as an erasure ok but then if there are two errors there can be only 8 other errors ok and you have to worry about how many erasures I can have I, I bet at this time I would have 8 erasures so if I have 8 erasures and 1 error I can correct right the only thing is two, 2 times the number of errors plus number of erasures should be less than or equal to t ok so depending on the number of erasures you can keep adjusting my decoder I know read solvent is really easy right kind of correcting erasures I just select that the polynomial is known and then you just do that. Is that okay? Is that clear? So, so try to see if you can show that that strategy will work for any combination of errors less than or equal to 10. You can have a strange situation like 3 of 10 might be in one place. Okay. Suppose you have 3 errors in one block and then the rest of the 7 errors are distributing like erasures. What will happen? That is okay. That works. You might have some crazy situation. Is it possible? Can you always correct? Uh, maybe it's possible. So you have to think about it. So it needs more careful analysis of the error events. Okay. So what you basically have to look at is how do bit errors map on to block errors? That is the crucial part. Okay. If it is favorable to you, then it's fine. If it's not favorable, it may not be fine. Okay. So so let me let me just leave it like that. So you can do a decoder. Okay, so basically you can do you can you have to do two decoders in the contact motion part. Okay, you can mark erasures with the inner decoder full of Okay, if the inner decoder fails, for instance for the parity case it will really fail right whenever there is parity is not satisfied you can't do anything so if you fail ok whenever the inner decoder fails you simply mark it as an erasure ok and outer usually it is going to be a read Solomon code and you can hope to correct errors plus erasures and the tricky aspect is to show what is the error correcting capability ok so computation of error correcting capability is a little hard but it is usually not so crucial it will work okay. decode it will work ok so error correcting capability is a bit uh, will require a bit more work you have to consider all cases and do it carefully, it can be done. Do it as a question mark. It is something you have to be very careful about. In this, even in the simple situation, we saw that the combinatorics is a little bit involved. You have to enumerate all the cases and see what happens. I believe it's okay. I think if you mark it as erasures, you'll be fine, I think. But you have to you have to prove that. No, I mean I'm not, not proving anything. But okay. So this is the concatenation idea, I hope it is clear. So we saw two different ideas, one was the product construction which was a little bit simpler and then the next is the concatenation idea which is also uh, interesting. Okay. So we will stop with this today and uh, this is kind of, uh, uh, I mean I think maybe there is one or two more constructions that I want to talk about, I will mention that uh, in the next class which will be next week, right, Monday. And then after that we will move on to weight distributions and Maybe close to it.